Welcome everyone to the, uh, the session of CPP on uh, formalizing category theory. So we've got three talks on formalizing category theory and various proof assistants. And the first one is Nils van der Vede on display benoidal categories for semantics of linear logic. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for having me here and good morning everybody. So this is a joint work with other people. Benedict Ahrens and Ralf Maltes were not here physically and Kobe Bullard was around there, if you can see where I'm pointing to. So yes, I'll be talking about uh, displayed monoidal categories, and I'll also uh, be looking at the semantics of linear logic. And because all of the talks in this session are about uh, category theory, I'll first give a very, very, very broad overview of what category entails to. So if you would look at this very abstractly, then you could say that category theory is an abstract framework for doing mathematics. Well, what does that even mean? Well, if you look at mathematics, like all kinds of variations of mathematics that you might do, there is a fair common share pattern, namely that the, what you're doing it often involves some kind of objects that you're looking at and morphisms, so like functions between them. For example, you might be looking at sets and functions between them. You might be looking at groups and homomorphisms between them. You might be looking at sets and relations between them. And each of these examples is captured by the notion of a category, and this allows us to deal with all of these examples very abstractly, and we have a shared framework of them. And in that shared framework, we can also characterize certain constructions that you might be interested in, like products, function spaces, and so on. So this is a rather powerful framework that we can use to abstractly describe fields of mathematics. But it's not only useful for the purpose of mathematics, it's also quite useful if you're doing uh, logic or computer science. What do I mean with this? Well, let's look at this following table. And in this table, I'm trying to do, uh, I'm, sh I'm showing how logic, programming language, and category theory all are kind of related to each other. So what do we do in logic? Well, we're interested in formulas. We might write down some proofs. And if we want to build up formulas, we might use certain connectives. And that's quite similar to what you might do in a programming language. Instead of writing down formulas, you're writing down types. Instead of writing proofs, you write programs. And then you, of course, want to make more complicated types for which you use all kinds of type constructors. And that's similar to what we do in category theory. Rather than writing down all kinds of formulas and types, we write down objects in the category that we're interested in. Rather than writing down proofs or programs, we write down morphisms. And again, we have uh, analogous stuff uh, like connectives or type constructors, and that, for that we use all kinds of categorical uh, constructions like limits, exponentials, and so on. So they're all kind of similar to each other, and this is why category theory is a good framework for studying semantics of like logics or programming languages. There's one interesting thing to note here is that there is some kind of linguistical differences, be, uh, linguistical difference between each of them. When we do like logic or programming language, we always use like introduction or elimination rule. We say, how can we form a term of this type and how can we eliminate it? Well, for category theory, we use like universal properties. So stuff like, oh, suppose we have a morphism like this, satisfying requirement like that, then we got a unique morphism such that blah, 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 blah. So there's a bit of a linguistical uh, difference between them, but essentially the same. So, of course, when people are studying this kind of stuff, they want to add features, features, and make it more sophisticated to deal with more complicated examples. And for that reason, people have been studying many different kinds of uh, categories. And these kind of categories model more difficult, more sophisticated aspects that you might see in either mathematics or in logic or in programming languages. And throughout this session, we'll be seeing three different kinds of categories. So in this talk, we'll be seeing monoidal categories. In the next talk by Nima, we'll be seeing double categories. Then we'll get a bit higher. And then in the final talk by Jonathan, we'll be 
going completely high and we working with infinity categories. But in this talk, we'll only be looking at monoid categories. Well, what are they? Well, let's look at the word. Monoidal, we see the word monoid. Category, we see the word category, because it is the word category. So basically, is what you get when you take these concepts of monoid and category and put them together. So what does this basically entail to? So if we have a category, we have uh, objects, morphisms, and we have certain morphisms, like, uh, which are the identity and composition, what do we have in a monoid? Well, the key thing is the multiplication. So if we have a monoid category, then we have a category with a suitable multiplication operation. So whenever we have a, oh, there's my mouse. Whenever we have two objects, we can, take, uh, we can multiply them to get uh, a tensor like this, and the same for the morphism. So for monoids, we also have a bunch of laws expressing associativity and unitality. We have similar laws for monoid category, but they are in a weak sense, and I won't be talking much about them during this talk. So I won't say much about them. And these, there are many kinds of examples you can have of monoid categories. So for, and they also have many different uh, applications. So first two kinds of examples that you might uh, see are, arise from sets and functions. And then we can find different ways to have this kind of products. We could take like a binary product of sets or a co-product of sets. If you think back to the world of monoids, we might, thinking, we might think of, oh, we have the natural numbers, and we can assign, you can assign it to monoid structure, one coming from addition, one coming from multiplication. So kind of similar here. We can look at a bit more sophisticated examples where we look at sets plus relations. Then we can get a nice monoidal structure using the binary product. And if you like algebra, then this is a canonical example that you might be interested in, abelian groups plus a tensor product. And monoidal categories have been used in many different uh, uh, places. So people used it for the semantics of linear logic. People also used it for quantum theory. And if you do domain theory and algebraic effects, you might see them as well when you're looking at uh, smash products. But in this talk, we'll only be looking at the semantics of linear logic, and I won't go full quantum on you. So that is a key uh, application area of this talk. Well, if your monoid categories and linear logic are quite closely related to each other, and the way you can see it is by comparing this multiplication operator to the standard stuff you have in linear logic. So if you do linear logic, then you might have this um, kind of conjunction, where you uh, take a conjunction of two formulas and you have uh, this kind of uh, introduction rule for it. And what happens here is that this context gets separated. So I have these re resources from gamma and from delta. The ones for gamma I use for phi, and the other one from delta I use for psi. This is quite similar to what you have in a monoidal category. This is the multiplication object, which was this operation. And this other is this multiplication of morphisms. So they're quite closely related to each other. And this is, if you understand one of them, so if you understand either monoidal categories or linear logic, you can use this correspondence to understand the other. And what we were interested in when we were looking at this paper is we were looking at how to construct complicated or actual models of linear logic. And in this area, many people have considered a wide variety of different models which vary in complexity. One of the standard models arises from like looking at commonites. This was, uh, I think, by Lafont. But people also look at other models, like Eilenberg-Moore categories of a co-monad. And there are many more models. And the question that we were interested in how can we construct these categories or these models in a nice way? And when we are looking at this, this, challenge, this challenge, then the essential question is, how can we construct complicated monoidal categories in a modular way? And that was the main thing that we looked at in the paper. And 
the way I will be, uh, what I'll be telling you during this talk is the following. So I'll first, all right, this is the contents of the paper, apologies. So what our paper does is we first introduce the notion of displaced monoidal category, and then we show them how we can use them for, uh, to construct complicated monoidal categories. I think this is a nice illustration of how you can use dependent types in the formalization of category theory. And yes, of course, it is formalized. And this is what we use. We use the COC and the Unimat library. And the way I will be illustrating and explaining our paper to you during this talk is as follows. So first, I'll tell a bit more about models of linear logic. And, and I will be talking a bit more about this model by Lafont using commonoids. And after that, I'll be talking about display categories, and in particular, display monoidal categories and how they relate to this original problem. So yeah, let's start with models of linear logic. And then I'll also be talking a bit more about what linear logic entails too precisely. The key feature of linear logic compared to ordinary logic that you might be used to is that if we're doing like normal logic, we're proving normal stuff, then we're allowed to use our assumptions as many times as we want. We can use them multiple times, or we can just ignore them. Everything is fine. But linear logic is based around the idea that if you eat your cake, you can't have it anymore. So you can use your assumptions precisely once. You can't use them, you can't like copy them and use them again. And you also are not allowed to delete your assumption. That is the key feature of linear logic. And then when you study this kind of logic, you might be interested in all kinds of connectives. And people have considered many of them. In this talk, we'll be interested in three main connectives, which is this uh, conjunction, an implication, and the bank modality operation. So this conjunction, allows you to prove like two things, but you need to separate the resources. This implication is like a function space where, allowed to use, where you must use the arguments precisely one. And this bank modality might look a bit strange because this bank modality, what it does, when you put an assumption in a bank, they are allowed to duplicate it. So that is the key feature of this bank modality. And people have considered uh, other operations as well, like the why not modality, all kinds of other kind of products and so on. But we're not, we are not discussing them in this talk or the paper. And the semantical side of the story is also quite interesting because historically what happened is that quite quickly people realized how to do this conjunction and this implication operation. It was like, oh yeah, yeah, symmetric model closed categories. Okay, sure. But this bank modality was more surprising, and that requires some, uh, quite some sophisticated research. And there have been many proposals uh, in the literature to interpret this bank modality. And the one, and the kind of proposal that the proposal that we're looking at is the notion of a linear nonlinear model, which I think date back to Nick Bantam, if I recall, and also other people in Cambridge, like Valeria de Paiva and Martin Highland. And the key idea here is that we have two worlds. We have a Cartesian world and we have a linear world. In this linear world, we must obey the laws of linear logic. We're not allowed to duplicate or delete our assumptions. But we also have a Cartesian world. And there we can duplicate and delete as we wish. And what this bank modality does, it is like a transfer from the linear world to the Cartesian world, and then we go back. And then this duplication happens in this Cartesian world, and then we go back and, oh, stuff has, uh, has been duplicated under a bang. You can make this mathematically precise using uh, uh, terminology from category theory. And the story here is that I can't find my mouse, of course, but here it is. So the story here is that we have L, which is our linear world. We have C which is our Cartesian world, and we have an adjunction between them, and then we can go from L to C, duplicate, and we can go back, and then this composition going from L to C and back is how we interpret the bang modality. 
So this is the kind of framework of models we'll be looking at for linear logic. And one of the key models that I mentioned in the beginning was by Lafont, and that was based on uh, relations, where we say that relations form our linear world, and then commonoids form our key, uh, not key word, from our Cartesian world. And yeah, so this is a classical example of a, a model of linear logic, and then the bang modality is interpreted by finite multisets. And if you inspect this kind of construction, then one of the key ingredients to construct this model is a construction of the category of commonoids and a proof that is monoidal. So let, let's look at that a bit closer. So what is a commonite? Well, if we think back about the story about deletion and uh, copying, well, a commonite allows us to delete and to copy. So this co-unit is a deletion operator because we go from X to nothing, and this co-multiplication is a copy operator because we go from X to X times X. So we have multiple assumptions available after copying. Oh, and there are laws, but okay, sure, there are laws. And what you want to do here is you want to construct a tensor operation on commonites. And this is where the form where formalization becomes interesting. So let's say you're going to do this like in the most naive way and you just think, okay, I'm just going to construct a tensor. Okay, tensor on this object. Okay, here, tensor, blah, 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 blah. You, you, you find it. But the issue that you get then is that you don't really get a modular construction or you get something that you can really reuse. Because let's say now someone comes and, no, 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 I don't want commonites, I want co magmas. I want to remove, I want to delete this co unit. And I still want to have this monoidal structure. Then you need to redo everything. So, and also, if someone is now like, oh, actually, I want to use this commonoid in a complicated, more complicated structure, then you again get this reusability issue. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to have a more modular approach to defining monoidal categories, because this is something you see when the, this is an issue that you meet when defining these categories. And if you, for our example, if you are, for example, interested in other models like arising from einberg moore categories, then these constructions that you use here can be reused for those as well. So by going for, these kind more, by going for more modular constructions, you get more reusable code, and that is an overall benefit. So this was, is the problem that we're looking at. And to give an idea of the kind of solution that we give, let's go to a more familiar structure that people might know, groups. And if you think about how to formalize groups, you could, of course, do it directly saying, oh, we have a set, such that with a multiplication, unit, inverse, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> but you could also take a different approach where you carve out the notion of a group structure. So instead of just saying, this is a group, you say, this is a group structure for a given set X. So for a given set X, you say that the group structure consists of a multiplication, an inverse unit, blah, 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 blah. And then if you want to define the notion of a group, you just say, oh, that's a set together with a group structure. So instead of defining it in one step, you take this intermediate step because that allows you to talk about this notion of group structure. And you can generalize this idea to arbitrary categories by using displayed categories. So how does that work? Well, suppose that we have a category C. We want to say what are structures on the objects on C, and we want to say what are structure-preserving maps. So what do we say? We say for every object, we have a type of structures of that object. And for all morphisms, going from X to Y, and for all structures Sx over X and Sy over Y, we have a type of structure preserving maps. So we specify what are the structures and we say what are the structure preserving maps. We can do this for groups. 
For every set, we say what are the group structures. For every, set, uh, every two group structures and a function between them, we express when that function is a group homomorphism. So this notion of display category is basically this carving out of the notion of a structure compared to the whole thing. And this language of, of having this notion of structure separate out is quite useful. <coughs> because, as I know, five minutes, I'm going to, because you can, have, you can develop your own language for structures, and then you can use this language to build up more complicated structures. So what you basically do is you take a whole interest, a concrete structure that you're interested in, you untangle it and you stratify it, and then you see that you use certain kind of common constructions to build it up. For example, you might be looking at some kind of product where you say, oh, we have two structures. We put them together. Or you might be looking at like adding a destructor. We're doing more co-algebraic structures, so we look at uh, the structures. So these, kind of, these are the kind of patterns that you see, and these are the kind of building blocks you use for structures to build up the structures that you actually want to look at, like commonites. And then, what we're interested in in this talk, we were interested in monoidal categories. Display categories do not immediately give us this monoidal structure. So we need to combine this notion with that of a monoidal category to get the monoidal categories that we wanted. So the idea here is that this notion that we're looking at of displayed monoidal category is what you get when you take displayed categories and monoidal categories and put them together in some sensible way. So to make it a bit more concrete, so if we have a monoidal category, we could take the product or the tensor of two objects. But for displayed monoidal categories, we're looking at these structures and we take the tensor of the structures. So that's basically what it is. And it's, if you inspect the actual definition, it's like you take the definition of monoidal category and you make it more dependent. And yeah, that's what it is. And yeah, so you could use them for, to construct like the, uh, the monoidal category of commonoids. And yeah, you would, for that, you first see that you need a general construction to add a destructor. You need to combine stuff. And yeah, for details, you can see the paper. So let me conclude the talk. I would say that the main takeaway is that displayed monoidal categories are a nice technique to build up complicated monoidal categories that you might see in practice. What we do in this paper, we define uh, this notion and we give con uh, the relevant theory for it. We also apply to a concrete case study, which is linear logic. And I think that, based on my experience with it, I think they make the formalization with some monoidal categories nicer to do and more convenient. And yeah, if you're interested, you can look up our paper. And I guess it's time for questions now. OK, uh, thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Um, so what's a model of linear logic using displayed monoidal categories? Yeah, so the, no, uh, the model, notion of model for linear logic stays the same. The part that we are using displayed monoidal categories for is to construct this category C. So we leave this notion of linear, nonlinear, no, non linear, non, whatever. We leave this notion the same, but we use this displayed monoidal categories to construct this, the relevant category here. Like, for example, if we go to Lafon, then we see that here we must use this category of commonoids. That is why we use the displayed monoidal categories. If we go to another um, model, then we might be putting the category, the einberg moore category here. That is where we use the display monoidal category. So we do not modify the notion of linear, nonlinear model, but we apply it to construct relevant category C here. Is it true that it C is like the sigma uh, that obtains from sigma in? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you have like this display monoidal category. And then you have the objects and the structures, and the sigma 
puts them together. So the sigma is indeed the key thing here. Yes. Hello. So uh, in a displayed monoidal category, just to make sure I got the definition right, so the set of functions, uh, sorry, the set of morphisms between Sx and Sy needs to be a subset of the morphisms from x to y, and I'm presuming it also needs to, you know, include the identity and all that kind of nonsense? This is in the right direction. So indeed, you can formulate this via like the subset. Yeah. But you can e e formulate it more general because, indeed, in, I think in the examples that I discussed, it was always a subset, and that's a oh. quite common example. But in the theory, we allowed it to be like amorphisms with some extra structure. Oh, okay, okay. For so example, you could be looking at the product, like you could look at the product of two categories, and then could say the thing here, the stuff that we add, is not amorphous. Then it doesn't become a subset, but it becomes amorphism with extra uh, structure. Oh. Okay, so, so that means that we assume the existence of a functor from functions from mm -hmm. Sx to Xy to, sorry, morphisms Sx to Xy to morphisms X to Y? Yeah, you have this functor. So okay. the, if it, it, it depends a bit on how you do it. So in our case, we use all kinds of dependent types. So this functor for us is constructed. So we, mm -hmm. s instead of saying like, oh, we have a functor like this, we say, we use this dependent type like formulation. So we have like X to Y, and then we say, what are the things above it? What are the structures for it? And then we construct this function by forgetting the structure. Oh, okay, so, so, so it's like a relation between like morphisms X to Y, and then so you can have a whole family of morphisms from SX to XY yes. that all erase to the same morphism X to Y. Yes. Okay, okay, I just wanted to make sure if like you're allowed to collapse things or not, because it was confusing. Yeah, yeah. It is a good question. It's good to make this clear. In the examples that indeed I was talking, it's always these subsets, but that's not necessary, yes. Hi. Um, so, as I understand it, you're formalizing something in a mechanized proof assistant. Now, I'm just interested in like sort of the practical aspects of this because there's multiple ways to approach monoidal categories, of course. Like one, one way is by means of coherence coherence diagrams and so on. The other way is, of course, there's a, a, a famous theorem that says that you can rectify monoidal categories so that you actually get strictly commuting diagrams. Which, appraise, which approach do you use and why? So, okay, that's a, a actually quite interesting and nuanced question. So if we look at like set theoretic mathematics, then you just want to use the strict ones because they just make everything nice because the weak ones, they just pollute everything with the annoying associators and unitors, which make everything more complicated. But when you're working in an intentional setting, if you're going to work with this kind of strict notion, then these associators and unitors will still come up. They will still pollute your terms. Because you say two things are equal, but they're only equal up to an identity, so up to a proven identity. So if you're using a strict notion, it doesn't really offer a huge advantage over the weak notion, in my opinion, because you still get harassed by all these annoying, I'm talking from experience, as you can hear, I'm t this is like deep in my mind, that you are getting annoyed by all of these annoying association users that make the whole proofing process more complicated. So we use the weak ones because it fits this intentional foundations better, which is common in like most proof assistants these days. Yeah. yeah, I guess the problem even comes up in the setting of just mathematical sets where the Cartesian yeah. product is not strictly associative. But there are these, there's this like theorem that says that no matter how you associate things, yes. you get the same, you get the same uh, morphism. So yes. you use stuff like this. Yeah, so uh, th there is also an aspect of how do we uh, apply this here. So there is some kind of engineering, like uh, how do you get a useful coherence method? So let me switch to the next talk. Okay. So yeah, so there is indeed that kind of aspect. So how do you get this coherence? But uh, the kind of setting that you're then still working with is this intentional one, and the weak ones, and then you might only use these kind of tactics or this kind of coherence when you need to prove some complicated goal. That is, I would say, more of the, uh, how I think it would look, how I would approach that, yes. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks speaker again. Thank you. Thank you.